Well, we're coming into the last part of our programme that we call Live on Live. And this Wednesday, I am delighted to welcome to the programme, in the flesh and not on the line, from Washington, France 24 RFI correspondent in the American capital, Philip Crowther. Philip, you are very welcome, finally, to be on the programme. Thank you very much for having me. And it's great to see you in civilian clothes and not uh, on the usual France 24 uh, suit and tie, not here at RFI in any case. Yeah, I thought I'd put on my radio clothes today. Well, in all fairness... Philip, it's great to have you on the programme at last. And firstly, I'd like to just say I want to get away from, well, for now, <laughs> for now, all of the US politics, uh, that we always have you on. We're, you're a reg very regular uh, appearance on our programmes here on Paris Live PM. Um, but what we really want to find out today is what goes on behind the scenes. Yeah, I didn't know Washington. anything about that. Yeah, no, you're, I'll, I'll give you a few little, you're, little you're, snippets here and there. You're yeah. only front of camera. But let's just look. I mean, you're, you've been based in Washington how long now? It's been five years now. Five, five years is a long time for a foreign correspondent. Five years. Well, let's, let's just have a look. The press corps in Washington, I mean, there must be incredible rivalries. I mean, is it all rivalry? Is there, co is there camaraderie? Is there cooperation? Is there backstabbing? What exactly? What, give, could you give a word that can epitomize working in the media? Yeah, in I the think US it's probably government. backstabbing. We're done. Backstabbing. Uh, no, <laughs> it's, um, they, obviously, we, we hate each other largely, uh, but we work together a little bit. Uh, take the White House for an, as an example. There's a a massive press corps, of course, inside the White House. Uh, most of them are uh, from the cable news channels uh, or from the big uh, uh, the big TV channels. Uh, they sit in the front row in the briefing room. Behind them, you've got the written press. And right at the back, most of the time standing, uh, you have people like uh, like me, uh, the foreign press. And the foreign press does work together a little bit. Does it Does it go in, um, does, it, does it range from uh, degrees of how many billions are actually behind the channel to how many, just hundreds of thousands? I, it, it's, it's somewhere between that and who the White House wants to get them to distribute their message, essentially. I hear It's you. interesting, the Associated Press has the very front seat in front of the press secretary or the president when he comes into the briefing room. Hmm. They always start the briefing out with the Associated Press. It's just a historic thing. And then we all put our hands up uh, in the back rows or sometimes the foreign press seat, and there is one, uh, we share it between, uh, I think it's around 15 of us. In so rotation? It, or... Yes, it's a rotation. Okay. So I, I, I sit there twice a month. And, and I put my hand up. Is it, is it basically pot luck what the subject might be on the day? or you know, So you could find yourself very lucky in saying that you're being there on the day where they can announce that a meteor is about to come and destroy Earth. Or you could yeah, I'm hoping for day. that moment. Uh, <laughs> I want to be the last one standing reporting on that one. Uh, no, but, it's um, well, the, the, the press briefing, which you see on TV, sure. um, it's, it's rather boring in person. It, it lasts a long time, an hour and a quarter. Any subject uh, you want to talk about, you can ask that question. Um, so it's open in that sense. Uh, the, sa the same happens at the State Department. Uh, it is very impressive how much these people know, the press secretaries, that is, the spokespeople. Mm. But a lot of it is about, you know, deflecting the interesting questions. Exactly. It's basically blindsiding and batting off the... Uh they do. The they do that very well. It's a daily exercise. It's it's a lot of fun. And let's just um, have a look. I mean, uh, with the, the the other things that we don't really see on camera or hear in the media, uh, like the horse trading and the goings on in Capitol Hill. That you know, these are things that don't really make the news unless they're a scandal breaking uh, somewhere. Like, I mean, is it truly a viper pit of political intrigue, or is there a human side to all the lobbying and the fundraising? You, there's there's one thing you didn't mention there, I think, and it's I think it's it's your question. Is it like House of Cards? Is it like House of Cards? But you see, I mean, I don't know how many of our listeners know House of Cards. But I mean, there might be a lot of political people who are intrigue. Yeah. In, in that case, in the case of the TV series, including murder and the worst backstabbing possible. Now, I wouldn't know whether there is murder involved, uh, but it's 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 not personally it's, anyhow. It's, no, well, I'm not involved. Uh, it's 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 very dirty politics, and yes. it's it's a very it's a very nasty time right mm. now. Um, there are two political parties only in the United States who uh, more than ever, not necessarily more than ever, but ever since the advent or arrival of Barack Obama, have decided to hate each other um, from start to finish on en on everything. Explicitly rather than implicitly. I mean, yeah, it's, it's pretty it's, much... It's, it's pretty clear. They're still pretty subtle in how they uh, don't um, insult each other. But uh, Capitol Hill is a, is a tough spot. Uh, obviously, staffers from one congressman 
will have lunch with somebody from the other congressmen who hate each other, at least in the public eye, but they'll still get along. It's a fascinating place, Capitol Hill. Uh, the building itself is fascinating. There are tunnels underneath Capitol Hill. It's so big underneath the Capitol itself. There are actual metros, um, as in little subway Private trains. Private metros. There are or trains. Within there are trains that go from one office building to the next in case a congressman or a senator has to get uh, to a vote as quickly as possible. Were and these put in place because of the, during the Cold War because of a potential nuclear attack where they had to keep underground to keep government functioning? The things they put in place during the Cold War, I don't think I've seen. Those, <laughs> they're, they're, they're the other tunnels. Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't know about them myself, but mm. there's wonderful talk in Washington when we get bored about where do these tunnels go? Is there one from the Pentagon to the White House? How many floors are there under the White House? We know there are plenty. But Which bar does it lead to, I think, would be also now, very interestingly important. Interestingly <laughs> enough, it, it leads to a bowling alley. That ah, is a true story. More important, after, there a, is a, bowling after a nuclear alley. apocalypse, we all need to go we need bowling. To, yeah, that's, that's the last thing we will do. <laughs> also, the briefing room, back to that place, used to be the inside swimming pool at the White House. Mm. After John F. Kennedy, it was changed into the briefing room. And rumour has it that some things happened in that swimming pool with ladies who shouldn't have been there. Sure. Uh, quickly after that, it was turned into the briefing room. There's a lot of irony in that somewhere. Exactly. Um, debriefing. Yeah. De debriefing <laughs> indeed. Yeah, Unbriefing, yes, uh... debriefing. <laughs> but now you did touch on it there about the acrimony that has developed between the two hmm. the two parties um, since the uh, beginning of the Obama administration. Now, I mean, with Sanders, however, let's just look at it now. The Sanders, though, it, he does seem to have stolen a lot of Hillary Clinton's thunder and, and she's just not working the magic that everybody expected her to do. I mean, this is also her second time going for the presidency. Well, people, are, people are bored by her already, amazingly. <laughs> She's not waving the magic wand, but look, let's just say, I mean, if we look into the crystal ball, I mean, with the Cleveland Convention coming up for the Republicans, let's mm -hmm. just say 98% chance that it will be a Clinton versus Trump, um, you know, presidential Indeed. campaign. Do you think it'll be a tight race? And I mean, look, the gloves are off and they're going to, mm -hmm. if they're not off, they're going to peel them down to bare knuckles. I mean, it's going to be a dirty spectacle. Will it be a tight race, though? Not necessarily. Uh, it's it's Hillary Clinton's to lose. I don't think it's necessarily Donald Trump's um, to win at this point. Uh, it's certainly going to be ugly, and there is too much time between now and November. Too much can go wrong for Hillary Clinton. Mm. I think that is her biggest worry uh, at this point. Uh, whether it's going to be close, well, things are always close in, in this two-party system in the United States. A landslide in the United States is something like a 54 to 46 percent win sure for one of the two sides uh, take a look at Trump though um, he is getting a lot of votes in these primaries but what his opponents keep on saying and they're right is that the percentage of Trump voters within the primaries is relatively big but the percentage of Republicans who decide who make the effort to vote in a Republican primary is relatively small within that, it's a relatively small percentage of people who will then vote in the general election. So that is why the Republican Party has to work very, very hard at this point to get a lot more people on board. Uh, Trump is a phenomenon, but what they have to do now, and you're, you've heard this many times from many politicians and, and from myself, Republicans now need to somehow unite or unify, and that's what they're working on. Well, right now. this is the question. I mean, we have got the Republican convention coming up in Cleveland. Like, is there anything that the dyed in the wool GOP, the grand old party conservatives, who are very proud uh, to be part of the party of Li Abraham Lincoln, and, Indeed, yeah. mm. uh, very old school conservatives, in the, in, the, in the true and right sense, is there anything that they can pull out of the hat to stop Donald Trump? It's pretty much too late now. Uh, yeah. It was that last chance uh, opportunity in Indiana, the primary when Ted Cruz very, very quickly, uh, quicker than any of us uh, expected, expected, dropped indeed. out. And, and the, thing, the whole thing was basically over. Um, there are a few very complex situations that luckily we don't have the time for me to, to explain because I, don't, because I don't understand them myself. Um, there is a possibility of a third party candidate coming in. That has nothing to do with the Republican convention. There are other parties out there we never talk about. There's a Libertarian party. Gary Johnson is their candidate. Where's Ross Perot? Is he still alive? He's, uh, I, is he? I um, don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know. No, I, I don't think so. Don't quote me on that you know, one. No, he could be in a cryogenic uh, chamber but, somewhere but you, with you, all those money. But you're, you're pointing me in the right 
right direction, though. <laughs> the Green Party is still mm. there. Uh, mm. and, and they do have a candidate. She's called Jill, Jill Steen. Mm. Gary Johnson for the Libertarian Party. You haven't heard of them yet. You might maybe in the next few months, and maybe I'll, I'll send you a little something on them, try and go meet them because they're a little bit more accessible. Uh, that's a possibility. Then uh, there's a possibility of the Republican Party, and with that I mean the Conservatives, the establishment as we call them, finding somebody somewhere. Mm. The problem is they have to get on the ballot in many US states to have a chance to even get those votes that might be theirs if voters are convinced. Basically, the conclusion is it's too late. Yeah. Uh, the Republican Party and its, and its establishment realized that this Trump phenomenon was becoming a real bandwagon Juggernaut. too late. Yes, well, The just, Trump train, the as, Trump he, train. as they call it now. Now, Philip, unfortunately, we've only got a few, we've got less than a minute left here. But one question I want to ask you, with the Trump train, with everything that you've witnessed, especially over the last, uh, the last few months, can one remain 100% objective as a journalist while reporting on the Republican primaries? Uh, the obvious answer is yes, especially because uh, because I'm I'm on live and, uh, and and this is being recorded. But no, yes, you you, you do. You um, rise because, above it. You don't yeah, get because, sucked in by the rhetoric. Well, you you have to call a spade a spade. Uh, mm -hmm. When something is racist, it is I think our responsibility to call it racist. If something could be interpreted as fascist, we have to ask the question: Is this truly fascist mm -hmm. in any sense? Uh, and when Donald Trump says something that is wrong, then we have to call him out on it. But essentially, the foreign correspondent's role is to understand and then explain and not criticize, I suppose. Philip Crowther, a pleasure to have you on the program today. Absolutely, sir. Thank you. Thank you. That's all we have for Parasite PM. Back tomorrow. Bye-bye.